and I am here to teach you about how to start a software business. I should mention I'm from Los Angeles, California, by the way. So first of all, why should you trust me? I am the founder and CTO of Juicer.io. Juicer.io is a, aggregate, or a social media aggregator, an embeddable social media aggregator. So what the hell is a social media aggregator? Essentially, what Juicer allows you to do is to connect all of your brands or your personal social media accounts, and it'll automatically pull in any new posts you have, and it'll give you a little snippet, a code snippet that you can put in your website, so it'll display all of these posts in a beautiful feed. So here's an example. This is actually from the thegoldenglobes.com. I don't know if you guys know what the Golden Globes is, but it's like sort of like a crappier version of the Oscars in the U.S., um, but it's still very popular, and actually, this, this feed itself had about... 20 million views over a two-day period. Um, but as you can see, there's different social media types. You've got Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc. So Juicer makes it really easy to connect all these accounts and embed them into a website. It's also oftentimes used at live events uh, and in concerts, you know, with hashtags, so people can you can see a sort of aggregated feed anywhere you are and participate in a conversation and have everyone see it. So, firstly, why would you want to start your own business at all? As William Wallace best said, freedom is the number one and most obvious reason to start your own business. Um, for a, a couple of examples, I've spent the last two months of the last six living in Los Angeles, where I live. Um, the other four months I spent traveling around the world. Um, I never set an alarm. I get to work whenever the hell I feel like it. And I get to live wherever I want as well. Secondly, also pretty obvious, is that the amount of effort you put in is linked to your pay. At a full-time job, there's no incentive to work to the best of your ability, necessarily, apart from worried about getting fired. So generally, you will work to the level that it'll keep you from getting fired. But there's no incentive to go above and beyond. Also, your salary is significantly less than the value you provide your employer. And so what this means is that you are a good deal for your employer. You're, you cost less than you are bringing in for the company. And this is especially true for developers who can easily work, earn the business they work for millions of dollars. And I'm willing to bet that your salary isn't millions of dollars. Finally, no one's ever gotten rich working for somebody else. Not that being rich is important, and it's certainly nice but it's certainly nice to realize that your earning potential is limitless compared to the 5% yearly raise you can hope for at your job or a 10% raise you can hope for from, get, from switching jobs. Obviously, there's a few guys in like finance and that sort of thing who make over a million dollars a year, but most developers don't. Uh, so firstly, I'm going to talk about my history prior to Juicer just so you can guys can get an idea of how what led me to starting Juicer. So like I said earlier, I have a degree in microbiology. And I started programming because I wanted to build a product, and I couldn't convince anyone else to do it for me. And I was a college student, so I didn't have the money to pay anyone. So I got turned on to Rails, um, and I built the product. Well, really what I did was I slowly learned how to program, built it in Rails, didn't really know what I was doing, finished it, threw it all out, started over, built it a lot better, and then sort of launched it a little bit, um, sent it to some of my friends, and I think I got maybe about 100 people to sign up for it. But what that led to was uh, one of the people who signed up was somebody I didn't know, and he said, hey, I like the site you built. Could you build me a site as well? And I have $5,000 to pay you with. And at the time, I said, well, yeah, sure. But inside, I was screaming because no one had ever offered me $5,000 for anything in my life at that point. And so I built the guy uh, his site. And then after that, somebody else contacted me. And you know, slowly but surely, this turned into a lucrative or somewhat lucrative side career as a freelancer. Um, so I, I started freelancing in my free time. I had a full-time job this whole time as well. Um, and just building sites when I could or when people wanted me to. Started doing a little more consulting work, a little bit more serious sort of freelancing, I guess. And then whenever I had free time, I would build random various products uh, in my, what, you know, whatever sort of idea that came to my head. So the rest of this talk, I guess, is going to be structured with sort of, I'm just going to talk about uh, what, what led to Juicer, where did I come up with the idea, and how did I build it, and you know, how did I promote it, and how did we get to the point where we're at today. And I'll talk to, about the point where we're at today, too, at some point as well. Um, so the first thing you need to do when starting your own business 
is to come up with an idea. And this is arguably the hardest thing of the whole process, coming up with an idea. Um, so the way Juicer worked was I had a string of freelance clients for a long time who asked me to put a social media feed on their website. They wanted to aggregate all of their different social media accounts uh, and put them on their website. So the first time a, a client asked me to do this, I Googled social media feed and I found a service that did this already. And I said, great, I don't have to build this myself. Somebody else can do it. So I found a service and a service is called Tint. Um, and they charge $10 a month to put a social media feed on your website. So I got the clients to sign up for it and they did and we put it on the website and it was great. And I had client after client after client would ask me for social media feed on their website. So I always brought them back to Tint. I said, let's go to Tint, Tint, Tint. It's $10 a month, it's great. Uh, and then in about halfway through 2014, I had a freelance client who uh, who said, hey, I want a social media feed on my website. And I said, great, let's go to Tint. And I went to Tint. I had probably hadn't been there in about six months or so. And I found that they had raised their prices from $10 a month to $250 a month. <laughs> I should mention, too, they've since raised their prices to $500 a month. And they may have raised it even higher at this point. Uh, so the client obviously said, yeah, we can't pay for that. We're not going to pay that much just to have a social media feed on our website. But can you build it for us? And a light bulb went off in my head. I said, not only I can build this, but what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to build a service, and you guys just sign up for it. So uh, that, that's sort of where Juicer came from. And I had my first client before I e even wrote a single line of code. Um, so now I'm going to talk about a couple of different ways a couple of different ways you can come up with ideas, hopefully. Um, the first and most obvious is to solve your own problem. And so you guys are all developers, and you've probably seen a myriad of developer tools out there that have sort of been started as products that will hopefully make your lives easier. So this is sort of the most common route taken with developers is solve a problem you have. And this is great because you're very close to the problem, so you have a good idea of what the solution should be. The problem, of course, with this is that it's a very crowded market. There's many, many developer tools. And I think developers are especially used to being pitched sort of startup ideas and product ideas. And we're a little bit numb to it. The second way to do this is to solve a problem for others. Uh, so what, what I mean by this is somebody who has a problem that's not a problem that you share. So for example, maybe you decide you want to build a uh, restaurant reservation management tool. You guys presumably don't own restaurants, so this isn't a problem that you have specifically, um, which can be great because you can really sort of tap into markets that don't typically get uh, the sort of attention that oftentimes like developers do. But of course, the problem with this is that you're further away from the actual problem. And the only way to really get to the core of what the problem it is that you're trying to solve is to talk to your customers. And oftentimes, the what the customers think they want and what they actually want are very different. And they oftentimes have trouble communicating that. And thirdly, which is sort of the route I took for Juicer, uh, is to solve a problem for someone you know. So I had many, many clients who all wanted social media feeds. And so I knew that this was a market that existed because somebody out there needed it. Multiple people out there needed it. So at the very least, I thought I could sell this to other developers who have the same the same problems I do is that their clients are asking for social media feeds for their website, but they uh, they <laughs> can't pay $500 a month to do so. So when you come up with an idea, I think it's very important to start small. And what I'm talking about here is to start, start with a small idea. So you want to um, build something that only a few people need, but those people really need it. So I didn't build a social media aggregator because I thought everyone in the world needs a social media aggregator, but there are certain businesses that would like to include something like that on their website. And so I thought I would build something like that for them because I know there's lots of businesses out there that have this need, but they don't have $500 a month to throw at the problem. So, I mean, so the next point that I'll make is that it's something to, it's something to make, it's better to make something that a few people love than a lot of people like. So what I mean by this is it's sort of the same thing I was talking about before, is to focus on a niche. And a, a small niche is good. And it seems counterintuitive because uh, it, when you focus on a niche, it doesn't really seem like there's anywhere to grow. But I'll remind you that Microsoft started as a, by creating a basic interpreter for the Altair computer in the 70s. So look at Microsoft now, and they started with an extreme niche. The next thing when coming up with an idea is to not worry about competitors. And I think the normal reaction when you see somebody else is already doing an idea that you have is to not to bother. 
I think it's very important to ignore this feeling. Competitors mean a couple things. Competitors mean that there is a market already, so that if somebody's doing this already, it means that there's a need for this out in the world. Um, Apple isn't the first company to ever make a computer by any means, but they did the best and are they're arguably the most successful computer company in the world. And Juicer started off with just a single competitor, which was Tint, but it turns out there's a lot of companies out there that do what Juicer does, like way more than you would think. There's got to be 50 plus in the world. And if I had known that when I first started, I probably would have been extremely discouraged. Um, but luckily, I was pretty lazy and didn't do very much research. And I knew. <laughs> so, um, but if I had, it was, it's entirely possible that I wouldn't have bothered. But I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter because there are a lot of competitors out there, but Juicer's doing just fine. Once you come up with an idea, I think it's very important that you name it. And this seems very counterintuitive as well. But there's a few reasons you want to do this. Um, one is because when you come up with a name for your product, it makes it real. It makes it more real in your mind, and you start taking it a little bit more seriously. Number two, when we get to the next step, which is build it, you're going to be typing that name a lot when you program it. Uh, so <laughs> it's good just so you don't have to go do some search and replace it if you decide to change your name later. And finally, it's good to have a dom domain name already purchased. That way, when you launch, you can launch it immediately, and you don't have to sort of waffle over what we're going to name it and what, are, what domain are we going to get. So I think it's really important to sort of do these, these relative, seemingly simple tasks first before you write a single line of code. So th the next step, and the part that you guys will excel at, is uh, build it. So. Um, I should note here that I'm not an especially good developer, but what I am good at is sort of starting a project from scratch and seeing it through to some sort of uh, deployable state. I'm not going to talk too much about how to actually program it because it's very highly dependent, but um, if you guys don't have a lot of practice sort of starting a, proje starting a project from scratch and uh, getting it to a deployable state, then I highly recommend just giving it a shot and trying it out because I know a lot of you guys work for pretty big companies and you probably have very specific tasks that you work on and you don't necessarily get to work on whole applications. So the first thing I'll say about building it is start small again. You'll notice I'll be, I'm saying start small quite a bit. Um, and what you're building here is the smallest pos possible product. And you've probably heard the term before, MVP, which stands for Minimum Viable Product. And what that is is a product that provides the, the most smallest atomic unit of usefulness. And obviously defining that is very hard to do, uh, depending on what it is you're trying to build. But I think it's really, really important to keep it as small as possible. And so when I built Juicer, I, I built it uh, in Rails, and I built it using JavaScript. And I knew it had to do a couple things because I had a client telling me specifically what it needed to do. It needed to have Facebook, Twitter, and, and Instagram in integrations. Um, and it needed to be able to embed in their website. That's all the client cared about. But then I needed it to do a few more things so that the client could then sign up for it. So it had to have a web interface, it had to have a authentication, and it had to have a Stripe integration so that I could accept payments from my customers. And that's it. That was all I did. The next thing I'll recommend is to design it yourself. And I know this may be a horrifying thought to some of you, but I promise you it's not too bad. You all learned how to be developers, so I can assure you you can all learn how to be designers as well. Um, <laughs> the first, I'll, I'll give you a couple of recommendations when it comes to designing things. But uh, my number one thing is don't bother with Photoshop. Just design it in the browser using CSS. If you guys don't know CSS, you can also learn that very quickly and easily. Um, use a couple basic design concepts like white space and alignment. Um, I won't go into too much detail about how to design something well because I don't know, honestly. Uh, but you can make something look decent enough. Um, and this is really important, I think, to design it yourself because it'll really get you into the nitty gritty of how it should work and what's the ideal user flow and how the, sh the site should work overall. And it'll really help you connect to the user, your customer, hopefully, um, and give you a sense of what they have to do to get your service to work. The next thing I'll say when when building it is to set a deadline. And I think this is really important because it's really easy to keep working and adding features and doing more and more and really putting out the concept of launching because I don't know about you guys, but as developers, the thing I'm most comfortable doing is programming and all that other stuff is not programming. And the more I can keep programming, the better in my mind. So for a few general rules of thumb, I'll say if you, ha if you have uh, full time to dedicate to your business that you're starting, 
uh, give yourselves two weeks to get to MVP point. And that sounds like an insanely short period of time. Um, and if you don't, if you have a full-time job and you're going to do this in your, in your free time, give yourselves four weeks. Anything else after that, uh, throw it out. If, it's, if, if you can't do it in that time, it's not important for the MVP. And this will really help you focus and sort of lean, in, lean your product down to exactly what it needs to be. So the next step after you build it is to launch it. And I highly recommend launching it as soon as possible. You want to get this thing out in front of users and have users using it or not using it. Get an idea of wh what your user base, how your user base is going to respond to it, if they are at all. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about how I launched Juicer. So I originally launched Juicer, and I got my one client to sign up, and I integrated it in their site pretty quickly. Uh, and then I decided I wanted to promote it a little bit more. So uh, I went to Reddit. And I went on to two subreddits because the first thing I did is I thought about who are my clients and in my or who are my customers. And in my mind, the number one client was uh, other web developers like me, other consultants or freelancers or people who work at companies who have been tasked with adding a social media feed to a client's website. And number two was social media marketers themselves, so go directly straight to the source. So I went on Reddit, and I found two subreddits that are exactly this, our web dev and our social media. Um, and so from there, somebody uh, found the site, they liked it, and they posted it to Product Hunt. And I didn't know what Product Hunt was at the time. This was mid-2014, so I think they had just launched. Um, so I remember somebody telling me it was on Product Hunt, and I was like, oh, like and they kind of told me like it was a really big deal. And I remember just saying, okay, I don't know what that is exactly. Um, but Product Hunt actually turned out to be really great. So hopefully um, I can give you a few sort of general rules of thumb that I've learned from this. Um, but the most important thing, I think, is to figure out who your customer is and where they are. And this sort of all comes, it's really kind of all part of step one, which is coming up with an idea, but it's really knowing, or at least trying to formulate in your head who you think your customer is, and then figure out where they are. So like I said, um, Reddit is a great place for that because there's a subreddit for basically every person or every type of person or every career. Um, so chances are you'll be able to find a subreddit that pertains to your customer base. Number two is Hacker News, news.ycombinator.com, uh, which is really great if you're building a sort of programmer-centric tool. Um, but be careful because they can be pretty harsh and negative, and it's kind of scary. <laughs> Uh, number three is Product Hunt, like I said. Uh, it's probably the best in terms of getting new users because everyone who gets its products on newsletters are just really interested in new products of all kinds. Um, but nowadays, I think pretty sure there's a waiting list, and it can be a little bit difficult to get on there. So um, the better way to get on there is to build a really good product. And finally, wherever your customer is. So like I said, the first thing you have to do is figure out where your customer is, and then the next place is to put it there. So if your customer is not a person like us as developers and spend all day online, uh, you're going to have to go offline and find them and, and tell them about your business there. You know, so conventions, their place of business, uh, giving calls, emails, showing up in person. All of these things sound scary, but they're totally valid methods for getting customers. Step four, get some customers, like I said. Um, so when once I had launched Juicer, it had been on ProdCon and Hacker News, or not on Hacker News, and on Reddit. Um, and, you know, it did pretty well. It had a couple of few days where I had a few hundred signups, I think. And then after that, just growth basically all the way down to zero. You know, maybe one user a day. Um, so I realized that I couldn't be continually launching it on all these sites, so I had to come up with a more solid way of growing our customer base. Um, so I, f I, I did so by focusing on a few things. And some of these are going to be a little counterintuitive because I think a lot of the time when you hear about growth hacking and growing a company, you sort of get the startup mentality, which is grow, grow, grow as fast as possible. You know, you want to do the hockey stick, right? And uh, I didn't do that with Juicer. We grew slowly but steadily. So the first thing we did was we focused on SEO. Uh, and for those who don't know, SEO is search engine optimization. So making yourself show up higher on Google, essentially. And I knew nothing about SEO. I knew that it was a thing, but I had no idea how to do it. So the first thing I did was Google a lot of stuff about how to get better at SEO. Um, and I've included a lot of the more uh, useful uh, links that I found in the show notes. 
But uh, essentially, the number one thing is you want to focus on keywords and get your site to be really, really fast. Um, and uh, so, I mean, optimization is great, um, and that's a whole topic into itself, so I won't really talk about it. But you want to make your site super, super fast. And then, secondly, sort of like coming up with an idea and coming up with a customer base is you want to focus on, or you want to determine what search results you want to show up in. So what are your keywords that you're going after in Google? Um, and a great way to do this is to use the Google AdWords keyword tool. And essentially what this does is allows you, typically you use it to purchase Google AdWords, which show up for certain search results. But it does two things that are really important that are relevant to SEO. Is it'll tell you the, the competition of that combination of keywords, and it will tell you the search frequency. So it'll tell you how many times in a month those particular combinations of words get searched. So ideally what you want is uh, a search term that is, has low competition and high search frequency. Chances are you're not going to be able to find this because they're very, very rare. Um, what's better than in this case, like I said, with the whole idea of starting small, is you want to find something that has both low competition and low search frequency. So if it's only a few people are searching for that a month, that's okay because those people probably desperately need what you're offering. Um, Another thing to focus on is the concept of long tail keywords. And what this is, is like very long and complex and specific uh, strings of characters for, you know, uh, very detailed search results that are very specific. So a great example for Juicer was how to embed a social media feed in a Shopify site. You know, there's probably 20 people a month that search for that. But those 20 people desperately want what we're offering. So we sort of come up with a couple combinations of things like that where, um, you know, various different sites and um, just sort of think about what I would search if I was a different customer type. And so my one really genius thought when it comes to SEO, and the thing I think that made SEO work more for us than anything else, was uh, by offering a free plan. Um, and I didn't really mention it before, but so Juicer is a SaaS business, so software as a service. So essentially what that means is that our customers, our paying customers, uh, pay for a month, they pay a monthly fee and they get to use our product indefinitely as long as they keep paying. But there's also a, a free tier. So it's, it's got more limited functionality, but it allows you to sign up and test it out. And it's free forever. So a lot of people can't afford to spend anything on this service, but uh, they still want a social media feed on their site. And we allow them to do so. The one caveat is that it has juicer branding in it. And so this was sort of my, my genius sort of double-edged uh, SEO insight is that um, not only are, is signing up for a paid account an incentive to get rid of the juicer branding out of your feed, but that juicer branding also is links on other people's sites that are linking back to juicer. And each one of those increases sort of our SEO juice. So. Obviously, that's not going to work for every type of business, but um, I think there's something like that for just about every product that uh, some sort of hack or, uh, you know, sort of uh, light bulb insight that everyone can have. Um, so the next thing I focused on was content marketing. And content marketing is essentially writing blog posts. And essentially, this is just a subset of SEO. And so, like I said, uh, a great blog post that I ended up writing was how to add a juicer social media feed to a Shopify site. And you'll notice that the titles is how to add a juicer social media feed. So it turns out one of the keywords we went after was social media feed. Um, so this, this is great for two reasons. One, because it increases your SEO juice as well. Uh, anyone who searches for Shopify social media feed is going to find us. Uh, and two is because it actually teaches something to your users, and it's useful to someone who finds it will then actually be able to follow along, uh, do what you say, and then they, their problem is solved, and they're happy. Um, and you always want to make your customers happy. Let's see. Um, the one sort of my, my one sort of genius insight as well with, with content marketing was, um, <laughs> as Juicer, I knew virtually nothing about social media marketing. So, and we were a company that that's what we do is we provided a tool for social media marketing. So it was a little embarrassing to have a Twitter account that had 50 followers and maybe even less. Um, so I sort of wrote a series of blog posts about our journey into social media marketing and sort of like what I learned and what I tried and what worked and di didn't work. And 
it ended up working out really well because people who were searching for, like, how do I grow my Twitter followers, would then come to us. They would learn something about that. And then as well, oh, by the way, Juicer will help you with this too. So it sort of like was like a, you know, another sort of two-pronged approach to growing our customer base. Uh, the next thing we did was we built a plugin uh, or an add-on. Um, and the first plugin that we built was for WordPress. And so WordPress uh, is, if you, for those who don't know, you probably all know, is like a crappy PHP framework, blog framework for your site. Um, so I had to write PHP code, which was nightmarish, but it was, uh, it ended up being great because, uh, for a few reasons, because one, we could submit it to the WordPress plugin directory immediately, and the WordPress plugin directory is super easy to optimize the search. You essentially just put a list of all the words you want to show up for, and then you just immediately show up on, and search for those. So uh, anyone who's using WordPress, oftentimes when they install a plugin, they don't go to Google, they just go directly to the WordPress directory and they'll search from there. So basically, overnight, we were showing up at the top of the WordPress plugin directory. Um, which was great. And, you know, it's really great because WordPress, anyone who's looking in the WordPress plugin directory is building a site. So those are your also customers right there, like people who need to add this to the site that they're building right now. Um, and the last thing I'll recommend, and I didn't have to do this because my business is online only, but you want to hit the street. Uh, if your customers aren't online, um, you're going to have to go talk to them in real life. Speaking of talk to your, talking to your customers, step number five is to talk to your customers. So you've built a product, you've launched it, and you've taken some steps towards uh, getting, growing your user base. Um, so when, when we first started Juicer, obviously we didn't have very many customers. We had a few people that signed up here and there. Um, but we, we almost immediately after launch put up a contact page and an email address on the site. And I don't think for the first couple weeks anyone contacted us really. But I could sort of observe uh, how people were using the site. Um, you know, people that weren't my family and friends and just signed up to be nice. Uh, and you know, I would reach out and, and talk to them and see, you know, what they thought about it. Um, just sort of email them and see if they had any thoughts one way or another about Juicer. Most people didn't respond to me, but a few did, and a few gave me really great insights. Um, and so during the same time, you know, people started slowly trickling in. The SEO, SEO takes a long time to take effect. I would say, I would say that magnitude of three to four months before we probably got any users from a Google search. And we got a few more from WordPress because that happened quite a bit more quickly. Um, but still, it got to the point where, you know, once a week I would get an email from a customer and all of a sudden twice a week I was getting an email from a customer and then once a day I was getting an email from a customer. Um, and so I handled all the customer service myself. So slowly but surely people started emailing us more and more and more. And uh, it got to the point where I was getting a bunch of emails a day. And I think it's really important, especially as the person who built the site, that you handle the customer service yourself. yourself. Don't have anyone else do it for you. Um, and this is for a few reasons. One, because you'll really sort of keep your finger on the pulse of your site. Um, you'll know what your customers are using it for, what problems they're having. What they'll definitely tell you about any bugs they have. Um, and you'll really get an idea of what they wish the product could do because they'll ask you, hey, can I can it do this? Um, so I think when you're doing customer service, uh, it's really important at first to be unscalable. So customers will ask you, hey, can your site do this? Or hey, I, I wish it did this. Um, and at, what I'd recommend doing, at, for, at least at first, is do all of it. So if they say, hey, can it do this? So, yep, or not the second, but now it does. Um, and so this will teach you uh, sort of like a, a big pain that your, your customers have to go through. So, um, so, you know, do it as manually as possible. I wouldn't recommend doing this, like building out a feature immediately. So do whatever it is your customers ask you to do and do it super manually. And you want to do this for a few reasons. One, because you don't want to waste your time building something that only one customer needs. And two, because if not one customer needs it, you'll get several people asking you to do it and a bunch of people asking you to do it, and eventually you'll get really sick of doing it. Um, and so this will give you a really good idea of what it is your customers have to go through uh, every time they're doing whatever task they wish your product did. And, and two, it's a, that means it's a really good feature idea for your product, and you should probably add it to your site, if at the very least, so you don't have to do it anymore yourself. But this 
if, if you get really sick of having to do something that a customer is asking you to do, that's a really good sign that it should be in your product. And so this is, that's where uh, improving your product comes from. So you do customer service enough, and you'll get a really good idea of what it is your product needs to have. So step number six is to repeat step five. If you guys remember that, it's customer service. Talk to your customer. So hopefully what's happening here is that people will sign up and they'll say, hey, I wish it did this, or hey, why doesn't it do this? And they'll keep asking you the same thing over and over, and you'll get really sick of it, and then you'll build it, and then people will stop asking that, but then they'll start asking you about something else. Hey, I wish it did this. Hey, I wish it did that. Uh, and just keep doing this over and over again. And so uh, eventually you'll reach a point which, which is known as product market fit, which is <laughs> knowing that whatever it is you're building has found its niche in the greater economic realm. Um, so you're going to have to keep repeating this for basically forever, though. Juicer is founded about two years ago, and I'm still repeating step five every day. Step number seven. Oh, not going to update. There we go. Okay. Step number seven. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Uh, so Juicer is definitely not the first product I've ever built. I'd say it's, it's somewhere around the seventh sort of full product I've built on my own. And it's definitely the first one I would consider to be successful by any sense of the word. Uh, so don't get enheartened, disheartened if what you tried doesn't work. Come up with something else and try again. Um, and so those are the sort of main first seven steps, I think, that it takes to build a product. And I kind of took a really wide brush strokes there, I think. But um, I just got a few more tips here for you. Um, and so the first one is create your business in your free time. I know I kind of gave... Uh, a bad rap to working a full-time job earlier, but I definitely don't recommend quitting your job immediately and going out and starting a business. Instead, create a business in your free time. Uh, and this is really easy if you're young and single and don't have kids. Uh, but <laughs> uh, if you are, I highly recommend, if you are all of those things, I highly recommend uh, building in your free time. Number two is to grow slow. Uh, so there's no rush. And there's a few reasons to grow slow. Um, and one is it'll become, allow you to become the master of your problem domain. So uh, if you're like me, you start a social media aggregation business, and you don't know anything about social media or aggreg aggregation or anything of that nature. Um, and by growing slow, I was able to really sort of understand how, what it is our customers are doing and why they want this service. Um, number two is it'll allow you to really get to know your customers. And the more you get to know your customers, provided you're a good person, and you probably are, the more your customers will like you. And the more your customers like you, the more people will sign up for your service. Um, so thirdly, another reason to go slow is allow you to scale your infrastructure without having to hire people. And so the nice thing about uh, growing slow is that you can do it yourself. And so this means you don't have to raise money, you know, be a real startup, which means the stakes are lower, it means it's less stressful, and it means that no one is your boss still, which to me is kind of the whole point. So um, the really nice thing about being developers, and we're all developers here, is that uh, what is the main reason that you, hi you raise money is to hire people, generally. And the first person you hire is a developer. You don't have to do that. Um, so besides that, you don't have to worry about actually wasting your time raising money, talking to your investors, keeping them updated about what it is you're working on. You get to spend all of your time working on your product. Another tip is to find a partner. So this is for a few reasons. And I generally recommend a non-technical par partner, but a technical partner is great as well. Uh, and they let you do a few things. So there's someone to bounce ideas off of, uh, which is really great just to have someone to talk about it because my girlfriend gets really sick of me talking about Juicer all the time. Um, it's someone to motivate you when you're not feeling motivated. Um, so I know that there were certain points during Juicer, especially right after we launched, where uh, if I didn't have a partner, I probably would have just given up because it seemed like an insurmountable problem to get customers. Um, but I had a partner, and I didn't want to let him down, so I kept working on it, and it paid off. And finally, the greatest part about having a partner is it's someone to do all the things you don't want to do. <laughs> uh, so a lot of this means like getting a bank account and setting up a proper corporate structure or talking to lawyers or really doing anything you don't want to do, which is great. So, uh, Juicer today, uh, Juicer's been around for almost two years. 
Um, when I first started, we had one customer and one paying customer, so we had a 100% conversion rate. And it's, it's gone down quite a bit since then. Uh, but now we have about 17,000 customers, and 10% of them are paying. Um, and it's by far the best paying job I've ever had. I work an average of one to four days on, or sorry, I work an average of one to four hours on Juicer per day, depending on how much I'm building uh, versus how much customer service I'm doing. And that's it. Any questions? So the question is, do we do any currency testing? And the answer is yes, we did. Uh, when we first started, we had one price in mind, which was Tint's old price, which is $10 a month. Um, and actually, the way it works was a little bit different. So when we first launched, uh, you got a 30-day trial, and there was one type of paying account, and it was $10 a month. And I think it was like sort of unlimited everything you want. It updates every 10 minutes. And nobody signed up. And so uh, one of the first things we did was actually introduce sort of like tiered pricing, like having different pricing models, and then offering the free version, free forever version. And that was sort of like a combination of my SEO plan. But also, people like choice to a certain extent. Um, so we sort of had like a real cheap version and then like a more expensive that was, and we sort of had to build more functionality to support the more expensive version. Well, that's a good question. The best timing to, to find a, a VC. Um, well, we haven't found any VC with Juicer. Well, people have actually reached out, but we've specifically told them we, we're not raising money, at least at this moment. Um, so uh, that's a good question. I, I, I think any time, if you need money, any time is a good time to find a VC. Sooner rather than later, oftentimes. Um, but I would generally say you want to at least validate your product at first. So you want to have built at least an MVP and gotten some users signed up and ideally are showing sort of up into the right growth. But uh, unfortunately, I'm not a master of <laughs> raising VC capital. So um, I, c I, c I can tell you the best overall. Okay, uh, so the question is two parts. Is one is like what makes Juicer, what made me think Juicer was going to be so more successful, or what makes Juicer more successful than my old products, and then what when did I know to give up on my old product? Um, and so the first thing I'll say is that Juicer is the first product I've ever built, like where from the get go I sort of had an idea of how to monetize it. Everything else I've always built, it's like oh I'll just build a cool thing and then people will sign up for it and then I'll be rich. Um, but I never really had any plans. So Juicer was the first one that was like an actual business from the beginning. Um, and then number two is how did I know when to give up on my other products? And um, I'll say that I didn't know. I didn't even really consciously give up on them. I just sort of stopped thinking about them, or slowly stopped thinking about them. Um, and, th and then, of course, the less attention I paid to them, the less they did of any sort. So. Um, I think generally you can tell, um, but for me it was sort of like the the, in, the I, I kind of thought at least when I first started doing this sort of thing that that all I had to do was build it and they will come sort of thing. But that's building building it is the easiest part and getting customers is the hard part. Um, well, there's a bunch of hard parts, but that's one of the hard parts. Um, and so I think a lot of the times I would just sort of build it, launch it, get out there, and be like, all right, my job's done. I'll just let that thing grow. And, um, and obviously that's not the way to approach it. So, uh, But I think you can tell. And if it's, if it's certainly if you're not thinking about it anymore, that's a good, a good sign. But um, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you the ideal time. Yeah, so the question is, uh, since I don't have a CS degree and I don't work with any other programmers, uh, what do I do when I need help or when I have questions or when I need to talk to someone about these sort of things? Um, well, I, I, I definitely think that getting a full-time job previously to this as a software engineer was one of my biggest sort of like learning experiences. It really accelerated um, what I knew. Um, and, you know, through those jobs I've had, I have various friends that I can talk to and I have surprisingly, a lot of friends who've sort of done similar things to me, and they don't really work full-time anymore and have started their own businesses. So we'll get together and talk a lot and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I use Stack Overflow a lot, even now, when I have questions about how something should be done, because, like I said, I don't definitely don't know how to do everything. Um, do a lot of Googling. Uh, it also helps my girlfriend who's a developer, so I can always bug her about things. <laughs> uh, I think that's all I got time for. Thanks, everyone.